Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen Flanagan, Senior Vice President and holder of the Henry Kissinger Chair here at CSIS. And on behalf of our President and CEO, Dr. John Hamray, and my, uh, my colleague, our Korea Chair, Victor Cha, it's a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to this, uh, this wonderful gathering of uh, Korean political leaders and experts on uh, Korea to discuss uh, the U.S. ROK Alliance and uh, Northeast Asian security. And we're delighted to have, as I said, such a, such a, a, a strong delegation from the Grand National Assembly here with us today. Uh, and um, to, uh, to, have, uh, to have the opportunity to hear both uh, from uh, Korean and American uh, thinkers on a number of uh, elements of the alliance relations. And you see the panel uh, agenda before you. Um, let me just start by, uh, by saying uh, uh, briefly a word of introduction to our keynote speaker today uh, from the National Assembly, uh, Representative, Mung Jung, uh, uh, Representative Chung Mung Jong, uh, who is, uh, of course, uh, a member of the Grand National Party, serving in his sixth term as member of the National Assembly. He is a member of the Foreign Affairs, Trade, and Unification Committee, as well as the president of the Korea-U.S. Interparliamentary Exchange. Um, he um, has uh, also uh, been a chair of the Board of Trustees of the Air Asia Foundation, and he serves as honorary chairman at the Asia Policy uh, Institute for Policy Studies, uh, and along with a number of other, uh, a number of other uh, uh, in informal and honorary duties. Representative Chung uh, received his PhD here at, uh, in Washington at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and he also has a master's degree from the Sloan School of Management at MIT. Uh, and he does undergraduate work uh, at Seoul National University. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Representative Chung uh, to let him have the keynote address. I should say that uh, this uh, conference uh, and his remarks are, are on the record. As you can see, we're recording uh, for posterity and uh, for further dissemination of this, uh, of this important discussion. So let me now turn it over to Representative Chung. Mind you, MJ, the floor is yours, mm -hmm. sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Flynn again. Flynn again, right. correct? <laughs> well, it is very nice to be in Washington at this beautiful time of a year. Thank you very much for your kind attendance out of your busy schedule. It is very nice to see old friends and to meet with new ones. It is a privilege for us to have this meeting with very important people in Washington. We Korean members of the National Assembly, we are members of the Korea-U.S. Parliamentary Council we are coming from this time from San Francisco and New York. To start with, let me introduce my colleagues. <clears throat> well, on my right, Dr. Kim Hyosok. He has his PhD in management from University of Georgia. He was floor leader of the Democratic Party, the government party at the time, and uh, he served also as a chairman of the police planning office, and he is now a member of agriculture and fishery committee. On my a little left, Ms. Park young son <laughs> she, <clears throat> she worked for TV broadcasting company, Muna Bangsong. She was the chief of the uh, economy division. She worked for Voice of America here in Washington, 85, 87. She was correspondent for the TV company in Los Angeles, 95. She is now alternate chairwoman of the Legal and Judiciary Committee and uh, member of the Intelligence Committee. To our disappointment, Dr. Kim and Ms. Park they now belong to opposition party. <laughs> Is it disappointing you? <laughs> <laughs> to our disappointment and the big worry. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> On my right, <clears throat> Mr. 
최구식 He was chief of a, a politics department at Joseon Daily, the largest newspaper in Korea. He is now alternate chairman of the Construction, Maritime, and Transport Committee. <clears throat> On his right, Mr. Baek song -un. he has his master degree from Syracuse University. He was chief of staff for presidential candidate Lee myung -bak. And he is now a member of Construction, Transport, and the Maritime Affairs Committee. On his right, <coughs> Hong, Mr. Hong Il-pyo, he was judge at the High Appeal Court in Seoul. He studied in London, and uh, he is now member of the Industry Committee. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot General Huang on my left. <laughs> I'm right-handed. <laughs> <laughs> General Huang is a graduate of Korean Military Academy. He worked as a military attaché here in Washington at Korean Embassy. He was a force command of UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus. He is now alternate chairman of the Intelligence Committee and member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. On my left, Dr. Ham, Ham Jebong over there. He was a uh, he. He was his PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins, Baltimore. Same Johns Hopkins, but different campus <laughs> from me. <laughs> and uh, he was a professor at Yonsei University. He worked at uh, UNESCO in Paris, and uh, he taught at USC, and he worked at RAND. He's now director of Asan Institute for Police Studies. Well, these are about to uh, all of us, and uh, Dr. Flynn again s said, I'm going, I'm going to deliver a keynote speech. I'm not sure wh whether mine is a keynote speech, but <laughs> I'll tell you what I think of the <clears throat> world out there. <coughs> the present world is not at peace. The foreign military intervention in Libya and the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster in Japan are overwhelming the whole world. The latest news today is that radiation contaminated water is spreading around the world through the North Pole. From the current situation in Middle East and Japan, we find important lessons and implications for the whole world and for my country and the neighboring region. It was reported that Japanese earthquake has literally moved Korean Peninsula eastward by five centimeter. Japanese nuclear crisis has shown how dangerous nuclear power can be even in the hands of scientifically advanced and responsible nation Japan. It makes us shudder to think that even as we speak, North Korea technologically questionable, unrepresentative, and irresponsible regime countries continue its quest for the nuclear bomb. The Libyan situation is an object lesson in what can happen in North Korea should a contingency arise. Muammar Gaddafi gave up his secret weapon program a week after the capture of Saddam Hussein in 2003. It, fright, it is frightening to think how different things might have been if Libya had possessed WMDs. North Korea not only possessed nuclear weapons, but also large stockpiles of chemical and biological weapons. A North Korean contingency is like an earthquake. We know it will happen. We just do not know when and how. Together, we need to be prepared. I hope you can have informative meeting on these important issues this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Representative Chung. Uh, do, do you want to go right into the panelists, Victor, or do you want to take a few questions, Mr. Chung? Did you want to? 
Okay, then I'll turn the, I'll turn the floor over the, then uh, to uh, Heim for uh, Mr. Heim for the uh, discussions uh, of the panels. I I just would like to introduce <laughs> General Huang, who would be the uh, lead off uh, discussion to to take us through uh, his thinking on the uh, Korea U.S. alliance. General Huang. Please. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction, and uh, it's my great honor to be here uh, with the other distinguished guests uh, from the National Assembly. And also, I'm so glad to have uh, this opportunity to meet with my uh, long friends here in Washington, D.C. And also, I'd like to appreciate you know, uh, your kind attendance uh, to make this symposium even better, to be even better. Uh, on behalf of the other uh, Korean uh, colleagues, uh, National Assembly uh, delegate, uh, I'd like to deliver my thoughts uh, about you know, uh, Korea-U.S. alliance, uh, which would be uh, one of the most successful and uh, proud history that we have been made, made during uh, the several decades. And uh, looking to the future, our kind of you know, assignments and uh, issues to be uh, uh, seriously or uh, sincerely taken care of uh, is another issue uh, to meet the future. And so uh, I'd like to briefly mention about my thoughts related to uh, Iraq uh, US alliance. Uh, I, I can say uh, the current status of Iraq and US alliance is maintaining uh, the best alliance relationship between two countries on the basis of common value and the trust. As U.S. President Obama and the Secretary of State Clinton uh, depicted it, Iraq and U.S. alliance is the linchpin, uh, linchpin uh, for the security of Asian Pacific region. And also, uh, as the South Korean uh, government and the citizens are uh, experiencing lots of uh, North Korea related you know, uh, threats. Uh, there were kind of a tendency that could be relaxed in terms of a security alertness. But as we experienced, you know, what Chonan uh, naval vessels were sinking last year, and again, uh, YP Island uh, artillery shell, our uprising concern has been made, and uh, we became, we uh, recognize the significance of this kind of you know, readiness posture together with our most important ally with the United States. And uh, our relationship and the alliance relationship has been uh, strengthened uh, through uh, several uh, uh, issues, several uh, opportunities, and uh, several efforts. First one, I'd like to uh, point out you know, uh, the uh, since Lee Myung Bak administration and the Obama administration has been uh, stepped in, there were five times of Iraq and U.S. summit meeting. Uh, since the two government uh, was uh, introduced. And also by adopting a future vision of alliance uh, in June uh, 2009, and also through close cooperation and coordinated North Korea policy, and also cooperated response to uh, North Korean uh, provocations. And the other thing that I can uh, point out is adjusting the timing of implementation of a wartime uh, upcon transfer. And also, our additional agreement on uh, Korea-US, Koros FTA uh, negotiation has been made. And uh, the other thing that I want to uh, point out is close cooperation uh, related to the two financial crisis uh, and also G20 summit, uh, which has uh, held uh, last year in Seoul. Uh, this kind of you know, uh, the ever presidented kind of you know, uh, the best alliance relationship uh, uh, is 
uh, notable uh, as we are having uh, such a kind of you know, the uh, uh, result of poll uh, that indicates you know, uh, uh, in uh, Korea, 87% of the Korean public, uh, together with the conservatives and the progressives in Korea, uh, is a supporting uh, ROG and uh, U.S. alliance, important and significant. That has been made uh, by the Asian Institute uh, last, uh, last June. And also, uh, I found 80% of U.S. Uh, citizens are uh, supporting uh, ROG and U.S. alliance is another important and uh, significant. Uh, this poll has been made June 10, uh, Chicago uh, International Affairs uh, Council. Uh, even though we are enjoying and we are satisfying this kind of you know, uh, excellent relationship between Korea and the United States, we, uh, however, understand uh, the ever-developing uh, this relationship is crucial. Uh, to meet the future uh, challenges by um, updating and upgrading our relationship. I think this will be possible and accomplish it through close cooperation and uh, consultation to fully implement the future vision of alliance. Now, uh, if uh, what uh, no. now uh, what we should do uh, to uh, update and uh, uh, upgrading our uh, you know alliance in between two countries, uh, I like to point out you know several uh, points uh, that we should be uh, pay attention and uh, uh, mutual efforts should be uh, doing. First one is the North Korean nuclear issue and also a conventional uh, kind of threat from the North. Uh, North Korean uh, nuclear ambition has been uh, complicated uh, together with uh, enriched program uh, un uh, uranium and uh, dragging uh, six-party talks and the, you know, uh, the disappointing kind of you know, uh, the progress uh, on related to uh, North Korean uh, nuclear uh, denuclearization. And also, as we experienced last year, there are continuing uh, everlasting uh, threat from the North and the provocative actions by the North. And so uh, additional efforts should be uh, paid uh, to respond and to, to manage this kind of uh, continued uh, threat from the North. Uh, and at this point, uh, I was uh, very much interested in uh, this kind of you know, uh, the newly uh, rising concerns in China related to North Korean nuclear uh, this kind of development. As we uh, understand, you know, uh, there were uh, atomic uh, plant in Japan uh, had a kind of a disaster. Uh, I found that there are uh, rising concerns in China related to North Korean uh, nu nuclear development. Uh, because they understand, you know, the uh, technology and uh, as kind of, you know, uh, the stand of their uh, facility uh, has a large lots of you know, vulnerabilities. Uh, Chinese are pay paying attention of North Korean uh, nuclear this kind of developments. And so, uh, what kind of implication of this kind of concern, uh, rising concerns in China, could impact related to uh, North Korean nuclear development? And the second one is you know, how to manage emerging China. We were very much disappointed when uh, China uh, linked to uh, North Korea whenever there were uh, kind of uh, provocative actions in the West Sea, uh, like you know, uh, Chonan uh, naval vessels sinking. Uh, they uh, didn't uh, accept. They didn't agree with the result of you know, joint uh, investigation uh, which has been made by uh, five uh, multinational kind of investigation team. And again, uh, even though there were uh, clear, proven kind of you know, uh, North Korean provocative actions uh, at the Yanpyeong Island artillery shell, uh, they didn't pay uh, lots of any concerns or they didn't ever condemn North Korea's uh, provocative actions. And so, as we understand, the emerging China is uh, notable. Uh, what kind of uh, efforts should be made to persuade uh, 
China to be a responsible country uh, to make the stable and the peaceful region uh, of Asian uh, Pacific. I would like to point out what are the implications of Japan uh, Jasmine Revolution. As there are uh, several uh, you know, occasions in uh, Tunisia and uh, in Libya and the other Middle East countries, there are uh, demarcation activities are going on, and uh, uh, we are concerning and we are watching carefully about you know. Uh, uh, the implication uh, that could be delivered uh, to China, and eventually, what kind of you know, uh, implications could be uh, sent to uh, North Korea? We understand China has uh, enough controlling power, uh, capacity, uh, capability, but uh, you know, uh, time goes on, then uh, there must be uh, more and more uh, increasing, uh, increasing kind of implication could be made, and eventually, that could affect North Korea also. And so we are uh, very cautiously watching uh, possible implications. And the fourthly, we are watching carefully about you know, the leadership changes in the region and the political instability uh, of Japan. There will be uh, many uh, presidential elections in China, in Korea, and uh, in Russia, uh, and so uh, in the United States. And uh, the Korea and the as for major powers surrounding the uh, Korean Peninsula, as there will be a leadership change, uh, we are cautiously watching what kind of you know, the after election uh, leadership environment could be made, uh, positively or uh, negatively. The fifth, Korea-US FTA. As we understand, Ragan Alliance has been successful, but uh, we understand that you know, alliance uh, was mostly a uh, security uh, century kind of alliance. And uh, looking to the future, uh, Raga and U.S. government made uh, this kind of a negotiation and understand, mutual understanding uh, to upgrade and uh, to uh, update our relationship uh, to be more comprehensive uh, looking to the future. And so I think uh, Kodosu FTA is one of the uh, most uh, important and uh, uh, meaningful juncture uh, to uh, improve our relationship uh, to be uh, even better and uh, to be more strengthened. And so, uh, as a conclusion, I, I would like to say uh, our relationship in between uh, two countries has been uh, the most successful one, but uh, we understand the necessity of uh, everlasting uh, efforts uh, to upgrade and updating uh, this kind of alliance and what kind of issues to be taken care of and the, what kind of you know, uh, uh, concentration has been made uh, to look into the future. And so the wisdom of our efforts uh, should we get together. And I hope to have uh, this kind of you know, wisdom from you and uh, the other colleague, uh, colleague members. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, General Hong, for those um, very interesting and thoughtful remarks. Our next speaker is um, Ambassador Jack Pritchard. As many of you know, Jack is president of the Korea Economic Institute, housed in this building on the 10th floor. Um, and prior to this, as many of you know, he was ambassador and special envoy for negotiations with the DPRK, as well as special assistant to the president and senior director for Asian Affairs on the National Security Council um, to, uh, for the Clinton administration. So Jack, thank you for coming today. Well, Victor, thank you very much. I <clears throat> want to extend my appreciation to CSIS for allowing me to go up and down the elevator rather than outside in the cold uh, to get here. Uh, but in a point in fact, uh, this is a, a terrific service that CSIS is doing uh, to have this type of a discussion with such a distinguished delegation of National Assembly members uh, here. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Uh, what I'm not going to do is to talk what I normally talk about, and that's North Korea, but you have a, a later panel that is charged with talking about North Korea and China. And I'm also not going to talk uh, about the course FTA because, likewise, there's another panel there. Uh, so I'm going to take my assignment uh, quite literally and talk about the Korea-U.S. alliance, at least from my point of view. Uh, and I have to be very careful not to say that I'm speaking on behalf of the entire United States population and government. I'm sure we'll have some, some differences of opinion. Uh, but from my perspective, I, I took a look at this as I was preparing, and I've come up with kind of four Ps 
not peas in a pod, but the initial P that I'm going to uh, uh, talk about, personalities, policies, promotion of the alliance, and potential. And the potential I'll get into a little bit later, and that's the potential for good or bad for the alliance, particularly beyond 2012. But just let me uh, stay at the outset. There are probably a number of things that will be uh, duplicated in my comments uh, based upon uh, General Huang's presentation. Uh, as you can well imagine, an alliance as close as this one uh, obviously has some very common values, and that's uh, one of the things that's uh, uh, very important in this alliance. Um, I'm going to start off by, by saying that uh, in my professional career, uh, I have been following U.S.-Japan activities uh, for more than 30 years and was part of that uh, uh, club, if you will, uh, that followed uh, um, Mike Mansfield's, uh, you know, there's no, there's no more important alliance uh, than the U.S.-Japan alliance, bar none, uh, club for quite a while. But I will tell you, from my perspective, the most important strategic alliance for the U.S. in Asia is the U.S. ROK alliance. It has eclipsed the U.S.-Japan alliance now for some while. Uh, and, I, and I don't think there's any danger of that uh, going back for any time soon. And in the discussion, we can talk about that if, if you like. Uh, let me start off with the, with the personalities. I am, uh, just by the nature of my past experience that uh, Victor alluded to, of having been in, uh, in the White House, the NSC, watching summitry, the meetings between presidents, uh, leaders. Uh, as General Huang indicated, there were five summits between President Obama and President Lee. I think these are extraordinarily important. They set the tone. Now, that doesn't mean that there is not already a good professional relationship uh, at the lower level, at the cabinet uh, level, uh, but certainly at the professional level. I think Victor can attest to that. Even during what was perceived as a trying time at the top of the relationship between former President No Mo Hyun and President Bush, uh, I have no doubt that Victor can attest to a very close working relationship with his counterparts uh, in Seoul. Uh, but it is uh, extremely important that the President of the United States and the President of Korea get along as well as they do. In my opinion, that's what put this over the top in terms of uh, the current uh, state of the alliance. There's some other uh, factors that have been involved as well, and that is the, the timing of this if you will, the movement of the alliance uh, to its current peak. And that is, uh, in the midst of a, an economic worldwide downturn, the Korean leadership in trying to find positive answers uh, in cooperation with uh, the Obama administration, uh, I think it has meant a great deal uh, to the United States. Um, the sense that Korea has made a strategic decision to go global, uh, is also important. It's moved beyond the tradition uh, where we have viewed the relationship on a peninsular uh, uh, view and occasionally from a regional point of view. Uh, today, this relationship is quite global in nature. Uh, you can go back, when we talk a little bit about the, the summitry, go back to the State of the Union. Uh, that's a very telling point. For those Americans uh, who do not tune into the State of the Union from an Asian point of view, uh, it won't mean so much. But as I mentioned earlier, my, my uh, relationship with Japan, uh, living in Japan for nine years, and knowing that the Japanese would sit in front of a television set and count the number of times that Japan was mentioned in the State of the Union. Uh, you know, and, and when it was you know, one or two, they got really nervous. Um, now, let's go back to this most current State of the Union, uh, ROK 6, Japan 0 in the State of the Union uh, uh, World Cup matches. Uh, I, but I think that's telling. Um, you've seen the 
relationship from a point of view of trust in which the United States has looked to uh, regional and global leadership from Korea, the hosting of the G20 uh, is no small or insignificant uh, 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 step or, or factor in the relationship. Um, the reception that President o Obama received when he went to the G20 in Korea uh, was phenomenal. Uh, it, it kind of made his trip, which otherwise, if you recall reading about it, uh, really had been described in very negative terms. He had not been well received or, or his performance had not been well received uh, in other Asian countries. But uh, President Lee made him feel welcome, made him feel at home, and um, on the basis of the strength of the alliance, uh, President uh, Lee and Obama uh, move forward in their discussions. Uh, when any time you talk about the relationship, you talk in terms of, of reinforcing goals that support the alliance. You know, we're, we have no relationship in which we have 100% uh, a commonality, support of things, but the relationship with the U.S. and, the, and South Korea is uh, very close to that in, in many ways in terms of our market economy, our democracies, uh, our approach to uh, problem solving. Uh, it's become closer and closer. Uh, uh, the, when you take a look at the, the, the policy aspect of this, it's one in which that it was not potentially a natural fit. When you take a look at the approach that the Lee myung Bak administration brought in uh, when they first came into government, uh, and then the prospect of a Democratic president uh, in the post-George Bush eight-year period, uh, you would anticipate a far more liberal, perhaps uh, disagreements on policy, but it was absolutely the other way around. Uh, there was not a better uh, synergistic uh, look at uh, our common policies than you would find between uh, these two administrations. Uh, I think that's helped uh, a great deal. Uh, that, that the policy approach towards North Korea has been essentially lockstep. Now, there from an objective point of view, those, uh, there are a number of you out there who may very well criticize that or look to a point in time in the future when there ought to be some divergence, but you don't see it now, uh, not from the very beginning, not during crises, uh, as has been mentioned here with regard to the Chonan and the Yonpyeon in incidents uh, there. The U.S. has uh, essentially measured its own view towards North Korea uh, as to how Seoul views North Korea. The U.S. has been very careful not to step forward beyond the comfort level and the agreed position between Seoul and Washington. Uh, how, however you view that, it is a reflection of the strength and the consideration between the two governments. Um, and as I mentioned, the relationship has evolved, and I think uh, absolutely to the positive, from one in which we were in the post-Korean War period, building this relationship upon our strategic military and our security relationship, mm -hmm. uh, as you will hear later uh, in the uh, economic or, uh, of course, FTA panel. We've, we've gone well beyond that, and we can go into a number of those um, uh, examples uh, in a period of time when we can discuss things. There was a mention earlier of the joint vision statement uh, that was um, uh, uh, promulgated on the 16th of June 2009. That's relatively early in the Obama administration, uh, but I think it's important because this is a post-North uh, Korea mini crisis for the Obama administration um, and dealing and thinking in terms of uh, economic uh, um, recovery. Uh, the London summit had already taken place. So there's a lot of things that were already under the belt there. But if you were to take it as I did recently and pull out the joint um, alliance, the, the vision statement, 
and just tried to think of words that would characterize each of the, uh, the paragraphs in here, and I'm just going to go through a few of these. You know, I go through global, shared values, a people-to-people -people connection, comprehensive in nature, these are my characterizations, uh, and update or moderniza modernization, modernization of the roles and mission, uh, an increase in economic cooperation, uh, reiteration of a common view towards North Korea, uh, regional transparency and how we uh, work together uh, in the region, the tackling of cross-border challenges, and, a folk, and, it, and it ends on what I think is one of the primary strengths now, and that is a focus on the consultation process uh, but to, between the two. Uh, I think that is absolutely uh, important. When you take a look at uh, just one example that's near and dear to my friend General Huang's heart, and that is the um, uh, OPCON transfer issue. I can remember maybe three or four years ago, he led a delegation. It was in, in we had a, uh, a meeting in my organization. Uh, and, and he was adamantly opposed to where this uh, process was going and the timelines involved. And uh, he was not getting a very receptive uh, um, uh, consideration from a U.S. point of view. Now, because of the strength of this relationship and the things that have occurred, uh, the U.S. and the South Koreans have overcome what otherwise might be institutional inertia uh, and have changed uh, for, from the, each perspective to the better how the OPCON transfer and when it will take place will occur. So let me start to wrap up by talking about things to watch in the future for the alliance. As good as the alliance is, there are some things that are relatively minor now, but depending on how we collectively, U.S. and ROK, handle them, they may very well have an impact on the future of the alliance, good or bad, and this is the potential aspect of it. You know, there is an anticipation that the United States, with the release of the U.N. Uh, World Food Program uh, survey on North Korea will begin some type of food aid uh, to North Korea. And not that's a, a, a bad issue at, at all, uh, but there is uh, some concern within Seoul of where this will go, how it will be handled, what the level of consultation will be. And you, you end up with the potential of if there is any degree of insecurity in the ROK with regard to how the United States is proceeding, you may very well see a slight rush to engage, uh, at least on a humanitarian effort on the part of the ROK, which then could lead to a little bit of drifting or a lot of drifting uh, of the approach between the United States and the ROK on how to handle the uh, North Korean uh, issue. Uh, another point to look for, and, and I don't know how this is going to turn out. You will recall several years ago under uh, Secretary uh, of uh, Def Defense uh, Rumsfeld, uh, the United States and the ROK came up with an agreement uh, that would allow U.S. troops to be redeployed uh, in the region or out of, out of the, off the peninsula uh, called strategic flexibility. And that has simply been a concept until now. And we've gotten this past week uh, the announcement of U.S. troops from U.S. forces Korea uh, that will be uh, moving to the Philippines to participate in an exercise. The first tangible um, uh, implementation of that concept. I don't know how that's going to be received. I don't know what the precedent means in the future with regard to U.S. forces uh, in Korea, but I do think it's something to watch. Um, something that I initially put off as um, perhaps not as important as it is turning out to be, and that is the current thinking about uh, nuclear deterrence in, on the Korean Peninsula and the potential desire uh, for a nuclear weapon or, in some cases, uh, the uh, reintroduction of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. This has a, 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 a potential impact for a significant 
and potentially uh, controversial discussion between the two countries. It also has the potential for uh, having an impact on the future renegotiations of the U.S. Uh, ROK nuclear agreement that is due for uh, re-signing, renegotiating by 2014. Um, this started uh, with an editorial. It may have started well before that. It got my attention by an editorial and additional comments along the way. But what I have seen most recently is a characterization that it is the majority, by a large percent, uh, of the view of the people of, the, of South Korea. Uh, for me, that has an imp uh, somewhat of an implication on uh, the uh, value and the trust of the U.S. nuclear deterrent. Uh, uh, situation. So that's another one to look for. And of course, as we have mentioned, there are a lot of changes that are going to be occurring or potentially occurring in 2012. And as I was reading today, earlier today, uh, there's a concern upon the GNP's uh, 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 point of view that they may not retain a majority after the April 2000 and. Uh, 12 um, uh, election, and what type of leader will follow in the presidential elections at the end of the year. Uh, so there's a lot of unknowns out there as we look to the election cycles that will occur in the United States, uh, in China, if you call those elections, but the change in leadership, uh, Russia, South Korea, and the, uh, the bi-monthly change in leadership that occurs in Japan, or we've gone back to that. Uh, so uh, let me end with that by simply saying that I, I try to take a broader overview uh, of the alliance relationship uh, uh, and, uh, and end where I started in that it is a remarkable achievement that an alliance that was born out of a wartime situation has grown to the maturity and the depth that it is today across the board, well beyond the security aspects of it, uh, to the point where I'm very confident in saying the U.S.-Korea alliance is, in fact, uh, the most important strategic alliance to the United States in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Pritchard. Um, I think we should just move straight into the, the next session uh, rather than taking questions on this. I think we'll have uh, plenty of time at, at, at the end. Uh, I would now uh, next ask uh, Representative uh, uh, Park Young sun to take us through the first uh, presentation on, on the North Korea-China relations. Please. Thank you. I lived in Washington, D.C. about 26 years ago. At that time, I'm, I was really, really young son, not old son. <laughs> During this trip, I mentioned several times the term balance. Today, I also would like to speak about balanced relationship. Uh, recently, uh, interdependency between Korea and U.S. has increased. So the interdependency between China and North Korea has also increased. For example, China has accepted the succession in North Korea without any comment over Chan'an. Although China views North Korea not that favorably, China has no alternatives but to be friendly with North Korea to maintain the balance of power with the U.S. Nowadays, China and North Korea economic relationship more strengthened, so we are concerned about China's influence over North Korea. Uh, when we were the ruling party, we adopted the sunshine policy toward North Korea. Uh, my recollection is that President of China, Hu Jintao, was having a hard time in deciding which country he will visit first between North and South Korea. Hu Jintao initially was going to visit South Korea without visiting North Korea. But at that time, North Korea complained about that. Uh, he made a short trip to North Korea and then visited South Korea. I think North Korea was 
cooperating with U.S. at that time. I think a balanced relationship is very important. Although it appears to be a bit late, I think the U.S. needs to give a carrot to North Korea now. I wish U.S. begins food aid to North Korea as soon as possible, according to WFP report. U.S. need to adopt a more balanced diplomacy using both the carrot and the stick. I expect that U.S. has a clear sense of what the ramifications might be of a more balanced relationship, but it is worth exploring especially if it would improve the international environment in, North in Northeast Asia and Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Park. Um, I would now next ask, uh, like to ask uh, Representative Che Gushik to make some comments. Uh, you don't have to stick to China and North Korea. You are free to comment on whatever aspect. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Choi, and uh, uh, I'm Grand National Party. This is my second term. Mm, I used to work as a journalist. So uh, I am obliged, uh, I think I'm obliged to say sort of new story. And fortunately, concerning North Korea and China, uh, you will have the chance uh, to hear from prominent uh, congressmen, especially uh, Dr. Zhang, who is a real expert. So, mm, and uh, concerning uh, North Korea and China, uh, I fully agree uh, with uh, Dr. Zhang's opinion, whatever. So uh, I'd rather save time. Uh, and uh, let me make the best use of uh, this precious time. I want to tell you a story which I experienced uh, the day before yesterday. Uh, we uh, arrived from New York uh, to Washington. Uh, just on arrival, uh, we went to Korean War Memorial. And uh, after paying respect on the way back to bus, uh, I happened to meet a high school boy who shed uh, tears. And he was ac accompanied by uh, his teacher. And the teacher told me about the boy. They are from uh, South Carolina. And uh, the grandfather of uh, the boy died in Korean War. Uh, I was moved. And I said uh, to the boy, thank you more than three times. And uh, in Washington, uh, I uh, think about the tear of the boy again and again. Uh, from his age, uh, his father would have been just born when uh, the grandfather died. And I could guess uh, the life of the left family, the single mom and just uh, just born son uh, would have lived a uh, sort of tough life. And I, uh, probably the boy uh, would have uh, been told about uh, his uh, late grandfather and uh, again uh, he could have uh, figured out uh, what happened uh, after the death. And uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, we, the Korean people, are very uh, much appreciated uh, 
uh, to your sacrifice. But frankly speaking, we think uh, the sacrifice uh, is, is over a long time ago, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, but from the tear of the boy, I came to realize that uh, your sacrifice is still going on. Uh, so when I'm back to my country, uh, I think that uh, I will tell the story uh, to my Korean uh, uh, people. And another impression was uh, sort of a uh, very strong sense of history of your people. Uh, yeah, the tear of the boy can be just uh, uh, that of uh, family, but uh, I could, uh, he had never seen uh, his grandfather, and from South Carolina, I don't think uh, he came with his uh, teacher just for the uh, cherry blossom festival and so i felt that uh, that strong sense of history makes your country this great nation and again i'm very much appreciated yeah thank you Thank you, Representative Chair. Um, uh, next, I would like to ask uh, Representative Peck Songun. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Chair mentioned, uh, I am not also uh, specialized in this field of foreign affairs. Since uh, I had worked for the government, uh, as a high civil service for about 27 years, mainly in the field of local administration. But uh, I, it's a great honor for me to mention just a few points uh, to facilitate a discussion in this hall. Mm, Mao Zedong compared the relationship between China and North Korea to lips and teeth. If the lips are gone, the teeth would be exposed to the cold. Many South Korean people think Sino-North Korean uh, relationship still remains quite the same. Some people and experts argue that China isn't, isn't capable of playing tough with Pyongyang recently. Furthermore, they also say that China didn't know much about North Korea's political succession from Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un and the recently uh, revealed uh, uranium enrichment facility. Considering the two uh, countries' close ties, however, it's hard to swallow this argument. I'd rather think China seems well aware of these things, but it seems increasingly unwilling to do so. I'll tell you why I think this. First, while the Chinese may see North Korea as troublesome, it's an ally that provides benefits for China. Above all else, the North acts as a buffer state. Its collapse would mean China has to face the influence of the United States on its border, which China does not want. Secondly, the collapse of North Korea could trigger a vast flow of refugees into China. It is predicted that almost a half million North Korean refugees would flee to China, China's three northeastern provinces, including Heilongjiang, Jilin, and Liaoning. The three uh, provinces already accommodate about two million ethnic Koreans. If many other Koreans flood to the regions, China might struggle to control the areas. The worst case scenario for the country. In addition, the collapse of North Korea may even touch off a North Korean civil war that might include nuclear, nuclear weapons. 
uh, that may end up in the wrong hands, say, anti-Chinese factions composed of minority groups. Considering all these aspects, it's time to get over the notion that China is going to play a strong, pivotal role in handling its belligerent nuclear neighbor, North Korea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you said you weren't an expert, but uh, you did a very <laughs> good job of uh, describing the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, last but not least, on this particular panel, we have Representative Hong Il-pyo. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my first time to be here, and I feel very warm welcome. So I appreciate the CSIS, and thank you for, ladies and gentlemen, attending this place in the busy schedules. Ambassador Pritchard mentioned uh, uh, Grand National Party will not be majority after the next general election. I'm very sorry that uh, he revealed the confidential information. <laughs> so I, I think America will help GNP. <laughs> to continue the President Lee's leadership about the relationship of Korea and North Korea and China, I just I just like to comment the conceptual uh, points. North Korea will not collapse unless China stop supporting uh, North Korea by providing oil or uh, food. North Korea will not abandon the nuclear forces because it is the most efficient method to keep their regime. So Korea, Korean people wants hope America uh, will America affect the China to control the North Korea. But China is reluctant to uh, talk bad things to North Korea. And relationship between United States and China is not enough to uh, affect, uh, to solve this pro these problems. So uh, we cannot help Technology, there are not so many political alternatives. Jasmine revolutions affect to the China and North Korea. Uh, I agree with the, Mr. Huang's opinion. Uh, China, they will not be affected, and not to mention the North Korea. So the Human rights in North Korea, citizen groups and activities in Korea like to North Korean people have more access to the outside information. So they like to send balloons to the North Korea and uh, they like to send radios or some papers uh, so North Korean people hear about the uh, outside information, news. But the North Korean government sent blackmails several times to attack the targets where the balloons are sent. So people who live in that area opposed sending balloons to North Korea. I am from Incheon city. My constituency is Incheon city. Chenan thinking and Yanpyeong shelling were happened in Incheon area. So people's, people in Incheon are very much sensitive uh, during the crisis 
security crisis between South and North. Korean government made uh, very much efforts to improve the North Korean human rights. Korean government raised issues about the kidnapped Fisher means and the prisoners in Korean War. And Korean National Assembly prepared the Human Rights in North Korea Act. Uh, the bill is uh, reviewed in the Committee of Legal and Judiciary. Some people say in Korea, North Korea in the most uh, urgent problem is the food problem in North Korea. So the human rights problem is not so important as food aid. But so many distant from the North Korea testified uh, so many examples of uh, brutal invasion of human rights in North Korea. The distance in the borderline between China and North Korea, if they caught by police of China, if they sent to North Korea, they may face the danger of execution publicly. So, separately from the food aid, this problem is very important. The, man, the whole world should not ignore this issue. Of course, Korean government have to dialogue and negotiate with North Korean government. So there is a requirement of not provocating the North Korean government. So it's very complicated situation for South Korean government. But I think human rights problem is the universal validity problem. Uh, we have to cooperate in the whole world level, internationally, to improve the human rights in North Korea. Uh, on this table, the business council, US Korea Business Council, prepared some families. And I am from Incheon City, so I'd like to mention about the business of Incheon. There is a Songdo project in Incheon City, and the Samsung decided to invest the, to the Songdo. Uh, so please invest to the Songdo Incheon City, <laughs> America's <laughs> friends. It's, it's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Victor Chad, who will be uh, uh, officiating the next uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Hom. Um, so the next session is on Chorus FTA, um, and we have two, um, two very able and um, distinguished speakers. First will be Representative Kim, and then he will be followed by um, Tammy Overby. And I will properly introduce Tammy once we get to her, since she has not been introduced yet. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Victor. Uh, OK, I am really pleased to be here in Washington, D.C., which is a beautiful city. And there are a lot of cherry blossoms outside. And also, I have really the privilege to participate in this CSIS discussions on Korean-U.S. alliance. Well, the, I'd like to address some of the current status Korea-U.S. FTA and the, the major issues related to it. Uh, please, uh, please understand that my comments express only my personal view and do not represent 
any official opinions of the National Assembly of Korea or nor the Democratic Party in Korea. The, after the negotiations officially began in February 2006, the Korea-US FTA was bilaterally agreed upon on June 2007 after more than a year of negotiations. And subsequent re uh, renegotiations took place at the end of last year. But both the initial negotiations and renegotiations had, had been challenging, and there seems to be many mountains to overcome before the FTA can be ratified in both countries. The first issue involves the public opinion regarding the FTA in Korea. It is true that people employed in vulnerable industries such as agriculture have negative sentiments about the FTA. However, the predominant view is that the Korea FTA is strategic agreement that cannot be avoided to encourage, to ensure continued economic growth as more than 80% of the Korean GDP comes from overseas. And also it is inevitable to strengthen the US-Korean the alliance. However, the general considerations required when negotiating FTAs are a balance of benefits between two countries. And so we should ask to ourselves whether the benefits from FTAs are equally balanced between Korea and United States. The second issue involves how the Korea-US FTA agreed in June 2007 is being assessed. Uh, as you well all know, the following ratification FTAs with Chile, Singapore, and some other countries, Korea initiated FTA negotiations with the United States, the world's largest economy, to maximize national interest for FTA. Korea sought to gain mastery in the manufacturing sector such as the automobile, electrical, and electronic products, as well as the textile industries. The agriculture and fishery sectors would suffer losses in Korea. On the other hand, it was shown that the United States would receive significant benefits in terms of agricultural products, machinery and devices, and the chemical products, while suffering losses in apparels, footwear, and automobile, as the level of imports of these goods from Korea will increase. In Korea, the opposition from farmers and laborers is very strong at this moment. But more critical is the fact that the, the text of the FDA includes of the 12 toxic provisions that infringe on Korea's autonomy of economy. Of these 12, of these 12 provisions, let me take just four examples. The first one, the first example might be let it clauses. According to these clauses, the Korean level of market access cannot go back to pre-FTA days. For example, once the beef market is opened, imports cannot be restricted, even when there is an outbreak of medical disease. The second example is the negative list approach for opening services. The provision only lists services that are restricted while order all services not listed are open to the United States. The third example might be the most favored nation treatment, that's which is MFN. MFN is the principle under which Korea automatically grants the United States 
the same level of market access that it grants to any other countries. The fourth example is the investor state dispute settlements, which is ISD. This provision allows United Capital or Business Investing Korea to file suit against the Korean government to an international dispute settlement body. Given such toxic provisions, our party, the Democratic Party in Korea, as well as other opposition parties are opposing the ratification of the Korea-US FTA and have strongly demanded that these provisions be modified through bilateral discussions. But until now, unfortunately, there has been no change in this position. Subsequent negotiations that took place at the end of last year have further tilted the balance of Venice benefits as they reflected only the United States interest. For example, based on the renewed agreement, Korea would immediately reduce the tariff on US made motor vehicles from 4%, no, 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 example, from 8% to 4%, sorry, upon announcement and eliminate the remaining 4% five years later. While the previous text that provided for a phase out elimination of the 8% tariff over 10 years. Also, the Korean government accommodated U.S. demands to relax auto automotive safety and environmental standards. On the other hand, the Korean side only delayed the date of tariff elimination for imports of U.S. frozen pork from the previous agreed upon date of January 2014 to January 2016, uh, which is, is quite natural considering that the ratification is being delayed for more than two years. As such, the renegotiations only deepened the imbalance of enemies with drastic concessions. Many Koreans believe that Korea accommodated most of the demands from the United States. As renegotiations was held at a time following the North Korean's attack on Yeonpyeong Island. A, a great deal of negative views have been voiced by the general public about the results of the negotiations and is evaluated as a failure in achieving a balance of enemies for Korean side. The, another issue related to opening up the market for beef imports. Although the negotiations, renegotiations produced no additional explicit provisions related to beef imports, I've learned through unofficial channels that there has been additional pressure for market access from the United States. To prevent the inflow of medical disease into Korea, the Korean government allows imports of only cattle less than 30 months. But the United States want to secure full market access for United U.S. beef, regardless of the age. However, I like to state clearly that beef import issue is not subject to FTA negotiations. FTA and beef, beef issues should be separate. And it's also a matter of nation's quarantine sovereignty. In conclusion, the Korea-US FTA 
had failed to reflect the interests of the, the two countries in a balanced way. To ensure its smooth implementation, the malicious provisions that I mentioned earlier must be removed or relaxed in one way or other. Thank you for your kind listening. Thank you, Representative Kim. Um, speaking next will be Tammy Overby. Um, as many of you know, Tammy um, has been instrumental in promotion of the Chorus FTA. Um, she's currently Vice President for Asia at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And prior to that, spent many years in Seoul, um, most recently as President and CEO of AmCham, the American Chamber of Commerce um, in Korea. Um, so Tammy, thank you. Thanks, Victor. Um, and Representative Kim, um, as we want the agreements to be balanced, it's important that we have a balance of opinions. So mm -hmm. I will offer a little bit different opinion, so uh, please yes, forgive you're me. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, as Victor said, I do represent the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are the home to the U.S.-Korea FTA coalition. Uh, this coalition is made up of over a thousand American companies, um, local chambers of commerce across America, and uh, uh, industry associations who support the early ratification of the agreement. We are also the home for the U.S.-Korea Business Council. Um, one of uh, the primary initiatives that we have undertaken uh, in the last year and a half has been uh, a grassroots campaign. Uh, and I want to, to all the members of the National Assembly, let, let you know that your ambassador, Han Duk Su, and his team at the Korean Embassy have been outstanding partners uh, with the business community in this effort. Uh, last year, Ambassador Han went to 24 cities across t 12 states. Um, so literally, we took him from state to state across the United States talking about the benefits of the FTA. In fact, Ambassador Han and our team are in Florida today. They're in Orlando, uh, Ocala, and then they'll end up in Tallahassee, where he will give the keynote address to the uh, Florida State Legislature. Um, they have an international trade day, and he will be the keynote. Um, so we have been using our chamber network of city and state uh, and regional chambers to generate thousands of letters of support uh, for a ratification of the Korea FTA. Um, we have also scheduled and attended hundreds of Hill meetings where we've met with, uh, we started our approach with the freshman members of the uh, Congress, educating them about trade. Um, it, we've also uh, now focused on the returning members. Over half of the returning members have never voted for a trade agreement. So we really have a lot of education to do, again, on the benefits of this agreement. Um, there is clearly a lot of misinformation out there. So uh, it's incumbent upon us to really help explain why this really this agreement is in both countries' interests. Um, as uh, you know, the agreement was originally signed June 30th in 2007, and it languished for several years. Um, I, I am a little bit perplexed because one of the former members of, uh, uh, actually he was the um, Minister of Commerce under the No Mu Yun administration, um, uh, uh, Chairman Chung, uh, when he was um, minister, we actually lobbied um, on Capitol Hill um, for the agreement um, because he was commerce minister uh, during the time the agreement was negotiated. Uh, now he is w with an opposition party and he has a different view. Um, but again, the, 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 in our, my view, the agreement's the same agreement. Um, President, one of the reasons I think we were able to get to um, a better understanding on this agreement is the personal relationship between President Lee and President Obama. Um, and it was so good that last June on the side of the G20 meeting uh, in Canada, uh, President Obama um, put the very um, ambitious goal of trying to um, improve the agreement uh, um, by the G20 meeting in Seoul uh, last November. Um, I was in Seoul last November with our negotiators uh, and with my president and CEO uh, as we watched the two presidents give the, the press conference where they acknowledged they did not uh, achieve their goal. Uh, but they asked for a little more time uh, because they thought they were close. Um, and two governments, uh, and again, I can tell you that I've watched the negotiators, both sides, work very, very hard uh, for an extended period of time. 
Uh, and on December 3rd uh, in Columbia, Maryland, they completed uh, an additional agreement. And this agreement has unprecedented support among the U.S. business community. Um, to have Ford Motor Company, um, the United Auto Workers Union, uh, and Congressman Sandy Levin now strongly supporting this agreement uh, uh, makes, uh, is uh, uh, really an accomplishment of uh, huge proportions. Um, we believe that the Korea vote will be the high water vote for trade. Um, we have strong bipartisan support. Um, there are two other pending agreements, Colombia and Panama, uh, that the House leadership has been very clear, uh, and my organization, the U.S. Chamber, would like to see all three agreements uh, pass as soon as possible. Uh, but we understand that um, progress is being made on the Colombia agreement right now, and we are very hopeful that they will be sending uh, the Korea agreement up soon, and Korea, uh, Colombia and Panama will follow. Um, so we're very hopeful that we will get all three agreements um, by the end of the summer. Um, and with that, let me just stop, and we're well, happy to answer questions. Thank you for your attention. Right, well, thank you. Um, yes, Representative Joe. Well, I would like to say that well, the Dr. Kim, on my mm -hmm. right, okay. <laughs> said the Korea USFTA has provisions toxic and malicious provisions yeah, yeah, sure. sounds very strong <laughs> <laughs> but but dr kim also said at the moment his opinion does not reflect does not represent his party democratic party's official opinion so don't you don't have to worry that much <laughs> thank you uh, I, I didn't say I didn't say it is not the Democratic Party's opinion. I mean only official. That's not official opinion. It's not. It's your. It might be true. It, it, <laughs> it may become. It may become. Yeah, it may be true. So at that time, we'll start to worry. <laughs> Thank you. For the time being, we can remain <laughs> relaxed. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Well, I think that exchange just shows, um, and uh, this kudos to Representative Chung for leading a bipartisan delegation here um, to Washington. I mean, I think, no, I think that that is actually a very good thing, and that sort of discussion and debate is a very healthy part of, um, of the U.S.-Korea relationship as well as um, passage of this agreement. Uh, my role now is to just ask a couple of questions um, of, the, of the panelists, and I will um, ask, uh, since we have three topics, I'll just ask three very quick questions and then invite the panelists, um, if, they, if, they, if they choose to do so, to, to offer their thoughts. Um, the first on the, on, the, on the free trade agreement, since that is the discussion we left, is, um, you know, the, 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 the good thing, I guess, about an agreement like the Chorus FTA, which has been around for so long uh, in many ways, is that sooner or later, uh, everybody in each party in both the United States and in the ROK at one point or another both supported and opposed the agreement. <laughs> um, and, and that makes it, I guess, bipartisan in that sense. Uh, my question is, um, I think everybody would agree that when we think about the future of the alliance and how to make it better, I think there's very little disagreement that an FTA is one of the ways we do this to deepen the relationship, to take it really to the next level. And I guess the basic question I have both um, to represent Kim and to, to, to Tammy is what do you see in terms of our, the two legislatures, um, of whether you think that um, this has enough support in both the Congress and in, in the National Assembly to pass? So that's really just a bottom line question, whether you think the votes are there. Um, <clears throat> The second question I have for um, our North Korea panelists is um, a number of you mentioned the Jasmine Revolution in the Middle East. And I guess the, 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 the question there is, um, you know, Libya is very much on the minds of a lot of people here in Washington as well as in NATO these days. President Obama is going to give a speech tonight um, um, on, this, on this issue. And I guess the question is to what extent do you think uh, what is happening in Libya is affecting North Korean calculations. Um, 
Uh, and then the, the question for the U.S.-Korea alliance, uh, General Huang and Ambassador Pritchard, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the topic of food aid to North Korea has come up in, in a, among a couple of the participants. And while I do not think the Obama administration is ready to provide food uh, to North Korea, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that the U.S. will do their own assessment uh, subsequent to the WFP, that they'll send a USAID team, um, and they'll come back with their own assessment. And if the USAID team assesses a need, the United States has said very clearly that it does not use food as a political weapon. So I guess the question would be, do, do, to what extent do you think that this might um, throw a wrench into an otherwise very good relationship between the United States and the ROK? What would be um, the concerns if the United States did move ahead with providing food assistance to the DPRK? Um, how much of a problem would that be for the alliance, uh, alliance relationship? So I just wanted to put those three questions out there, um, and, uh, and um, I guess uh, if, should we start with the FTA panel? If they mm -hmm. could possibly offer some, some thoughts, uh, just your bottom line assessment of whether you think uh, the votes are there on, on, on both sides. Mm. Okay. With regard to FTA, the ratification in Korea, uh, we are just watching how the United States uh, is handling at this moment. If the United States Congress ratify the agreement, the Korean National Assembly will take necessary steps to pass the resolution. Uh, but you asked about the prospect, but you'd rather to ask MJ because he's the ruling party leader at this time. Do you know MJ? Michael Jackson. <laughs> Michael Jordan. Either way, Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan. <laughs> he's the leader of the ruling party, and the, the ruling party accounts for two-thirds of our National Assembly. And so even if we are opposing the agreement, if they determine to pass the legislation, there is no way for us to stop. Uh, and so how about, how do you think, MJ? Are <laughs> you <laughs> going to initiate after the US Congress? You are asking me now. Yes, yes. Thank you for your recognition as a government party leader. <laughs> well, the, when we were flying from Korea to U.S., we were worried to hear the news that Republican politicians put the Panama and Colombia FTA agreement together with Korea FTA. Many people in Korea now worry about that, but in New York, we heard some news that it's not really to obstruct the passage of Korea FTA, it's rather to, to be, to, well, to use the momentum of Korea US FTA to pass both Panama and Colombia FTA. Well, the, Dr. Kim Hyosok, my colleague, said if U.S. Congress pass the Korea U.S. FTA, then Korean National Assembly may pass Korea U.S. FTA. I don't understand why we have to wait for the passage of U.S. Wait, why I don't understand why we have to wait for the passage of U.S. Congress action on Korea U.S. FTA. This is a mutually beneficial agreement. And uh, I, when I go back, I'll tell my colleagues at the National Assembly that you have to do our own job, our own share, to do our best. We will do our best to pass Korea USFT at the National Assembly. And in order to do, do that, we need uh, help from Democratic Party. Thank you for your understanding. <laughs> 
uh, on the U.S. side, Congress, we, we absolutely will pass it. And uh, again, I believe it will be the high water mark. And if you passed it first, that would put more pressure on us. So <laughs> please feel free to put more pressure on us. But actually what you did with the EU, the Korea EU agreement goes into effect July 1st. Um, that date is on every member of Congress's mind and that's how we start our talking points. So um, it is your, uh, the Korea uh, view of getting out there and ensuring that you are not being left behind. We'll, you're going to pull us with you and kamsahamnida for that. Um, okay. Um, with Yes, Representative Chung. Yeah. You said this is a bipartisan delegation, so we should try our best to remain bipartisan until the end of this tour. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, the, as for I want to tell you my views on possible food aid from U.S. to North Korea, from South to North. Yeah. Nobody in South Korea oppose humanitarian aid to North Korea, whether it is from South Korea or from the U.S. But we recently, after the foreign intervention in Libya, North Korean government made the announcement that Libya is, is experiencing that kind of foreign intervention because Libya gave up its nuclear weapon. They said, we have a nuclear weapon, and if we, if we start to give food to North Korea, they may say the same thing. Food are coming from abroad because we are a nuclear state. We, we, are, we are ready to help North Korea, but we don't want to give long message to North Korea as we have done until recently. If I'm working, if I'm working as a staff for World Food Program, I may, I may write the same report to the top of, of, the, of the organization. If I'm working for World Food Program, the presence of a nuclear program in North Korea is not my responsibility. I just look at my duty and do my job. But the, what you say, the Korean Peninsula problem or North Korean problem is not regional problem. It's global problem, and and we have to look at look at the problem in a more comprehensive manner. As you, as some of you may know, my father and mother came from North Korea. My father wanted to help North Korea very much by giving humanitarian aid. I'm also more than willing to follow my father's footsteps, but life is not that simple. And as a responsible member of a Korean political community, we have to look at the consequences as well, not only the motivation. Thank you for your understanding. Thank, thank you very much for those comments. Um, perhaps General Hong and Ambassador Pritchard, would you like to? About the adjustment? Yeah. Adjustment yes. Yes. Sure. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, <clears throat> this is my uh, uh, my personal opinion related to Jasmine uh, revolution uh, implication to North Korea. As we understand, the North Korean leadership might uh, pay lots of attention and concern related to uh, Jasmine revolution or democratization uh, in North Africa and the Middle East. However, uh, he'll be assuring uh, his controlling power. Uh, to block any uh, foreign uh, kind of information flow into North Korea uh, as they are keeping uh, very uh, strict kind of regulation. Uh, as we understand, they don't have any internet in North Korea. They have only a limited intranet, and the information uh, flow is very limited. 
And so even though uh, leadership of North Korea can pay lots of attention and concern uh, toward the you know, Jasmine Revolution in the West, uh, in the Middle East, but uh, I think they can control that kind of you know, information flow uh, until the near future. Uh, and uh, they will do their best to, to uh, maximize their controlling capability uh, related to uh, which can allow uh, information flow uh, into North Korea, like uh, introduction or um, any uh, possible uh, kind of opportunity to be uh, sent to uh, North Korean people uh, by uh, South Koreans or uh, through uh, Manchuria, uh, like you know, uh, disket or any uh, kind of USBs, as they are concerning very much about. And also, they strictly uh, control the uh, one channel uh, TV and uh, one uh, single frequency uh, radio uh, broadcasting. And so, they do their best to, to control. Huh? and uh, strengthening their controlling uh, capability uh, to interdict any uh, information flow into North Korea. And uh, China also, uh, again and again, uh, implementing their very uh, strictly controlling any possible as kind of Jasmine uh, as kind of demonstration in China. Uh, it has been already couple of times uh, Chinese authority uh, stopped, huh? stopped you know, and blocked that kind of you know, demonstration in China. And so, uh, uh, as I said, you know, in the near future, there will be a, minim a minimum kind of, you know, uh, kind of influence to China as well. But if there could be uh, more and more information could flow into uh, China related to Jasmine Revolution, any development in the Middle East, uh, democratizing, democratization kind of a movement in the Middle East or whatever, then uh, there will be more and more information could flow into uh, China. And the once China uh, has much, much more information uh, flow from uh, Jasmine Revolution, then, then uh, North Korea will be uh, very difficult to huh? uh, absolute kind of uh, blocking that kind of information flow into North Korea. And so, uh, in summary, uh, in terms of a near future uh, kind of prediction, there will be a very limited you know, implication to North Korea. However, time goes on, there will be more and more concerns could be uh, raised related to that kind of you know, development. Well, the, I want to add a little more. In North Korea these days, there are hundreds of thousands mobile phones. Egyptian businessmen got permission from North Korea government, and uh, we understand there are hundreds of thousands of mobile phones, and so people along the North Korea-China border, they can communicate through mobile phones. So people in Ch China can communicate with North Korean in North Korea. So this, this is a significant difference now from before. There are, there, there are hundreds of radios, and the North Korean people can hear South Korean radio broadcasting. But if it is true, if it is correct, I also heard that there are more DVD players in North Korean family, more DVD players than read the number of radios. And they watch Chinese and Korean TV dramas. So North Korea now is, uh, I would say, very different from before. Mm -hmm.
have such kind of the jasmine revolution? Well, the, I said, what do you say, contingency is, well, the, is like an earthquake. Mm. There is a strong possibility we just do not know when and how. So I, I already mentioned the Jasmine Revolution uh, affect China and North Korea. Uh, North Korea, Kim Jong Il's calculation. Kim Jong Il will addict to nuclear forces program more than before. Uh, after watching the Qaddafi's situation, Qaddafi abandoned nuclear forces by negotiating with the United States, and he is attacked by the Western countries. So Kim Jong-il may think only nuclear forces can keep the Kim's regime, and China we we'll never give up the North Korea. China strongly backed the North Korea. So Western countries cannot attack the North Korea, like in Libya or Northern African countries. Another point is SNS, social network service. Like Mr. Representative Jung mentioned, there can, there is uh, some popularity in the cellular phone in North Korea. We, we've heard of the news, but I think it's very restrictive. It's not popular all over the country. So in short term, there is not so big possibility SNS revolution in North Korea. Of course, there will be a psychological effect in Kim Jong-il's mind. Mr. Jung revealed, has had an interview last Sunday in Korea with some broadcasting system. He introduced uh, uh, extreme confidential information to North Korea. Mr. Kim Jong-il, the former chairman, uh, Jung Ju Young, uh, Jung Mong, Mr. Jung Mong Jun's father, the dead father, uh, when he visited North Korea and met uh, Kim Jong Il, he confessed. He dreamed. Yeah, dreamed. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Jong Il dreamed. <laughs> uh, the North Korean sometimes North Korean people uh, throw the stones to Kim Jong Il. So he will be uh, withdrew. Uh, by this instance, but the situation cannot be changed easily. It's my private opinion. Let me say a little comment about that. As you might well know, the Jasmine Revolution was initiated in Tunisia. Uh, the reason why the, the Tunisia success had a success in, uh, is, is that the, the penetration of internet and Twitter uh, and Facebook uh, is very high in Tunisia. It's one of the highest in the world. Uh, if you think of the Tunisia's population, almost 50% of the total population in Tunisia is under 30 years of old. That's the reason why uh, the revolution was successful in Tunisia. If you think of the China and the North Korea, the, I quite agree with Mr. MJ, MJ about the, uh, the success. But it's a matter of time. It might take some time to penetrate the internet and Twitter in North Korea. So the, we don't know when, but it's a matter of time. Uh, I can't agree with MJ. And also the, with regard to the food ad to North Korea, 
the I think that the politics and humanitarian issues should be separate. Even if the Japan claims that Doctor Allen is their territory, uh, for which the many Koreans are very angry about that, but we are pleased to send all kinds of support to Japan. Why? The politics and humanitarian issues is different. This kind of principle should be applied to North Korea. That's my point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, President. Choi. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jung uh, said that uh, the North Korea contingency uh, is uh, like an earthquake. Am I right? Yeah. Am I right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah. MJ said that uh, North Korean contingency is like an earthquake. I can say the same to uh, Jasmine Revolution in North Korea. Uh, everybody knows it will come sooner or later. Uh, the problem is uh, when and how. Uh, as I've said, uh, I used to work as a journalist. Uh, what I came to realize uh, uh, from my career is the enormous power of information. Uh, when people don't know what's going on inside or outside, uh, they can be controlled. Uh, but uh, if they know what's going on, I think it's impossible uh, for any government to control. And so uh, there is an old saying that the penny is mightier than sword. Uh, the version of these days would be the internet is mightier than the sword. And I think uh, uh, the things uh, are happening in North Korea. The, the number of uh, internet or the, the, the number is, is not so important. Uh, the, thing, uh, the thing is, they know uh, something are happening in uh, authoritarian uh, countries. And even though they don't have uh, enough uh, internet devices, they have uh, the neighboring country, South Korea. They, uh, I think, and I've been told that uh, many North Korean people know uh, many things about uh, Korea. I think, uh, as uh, Dr. Kim said, uh, no, uh, it's uh, the uh, problem of time. Sooner or later, something will happen. But uh, unfortunately, uh, I cannot, I, I, I don't know <laughs> when. Uh, I'd like to add just uh, my viewpoint on North Korea's request for food aid. Uh, nobody will oppose to uh, supply and give some food for humanitarian uh, perspective. But in my view, and uh, I think our government's uh, position is also like this, we need some measures prior to give even uh, humanitarian aid by international society. That's two things. One is objective evaluation uh, of North uh, Korea's food production. As you might know, uh, WFP and FAO uh, represented a report recently uh, that is quite uh, a little bit different from the, that of uh, last November's. Uh, the recent one said 
North Korea has deteriorated uh, food production quite recent years. Uh, about 450,000 tons of food are needed. So that's okay, but it should be reviewed anyway. But the second condition is uh, an objective, uh, not objective, it's a kind of uh, transparency in distributing foods uh, through a clear monitoring. Uh, well, uh, placing some conditions irrelated to the food aid is not quite good, I guess. But we need some condition directly related to the food aid, which should have gone to uh, ordinary people instead of military or other purpose. That is our, my, my view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Representative Park, would you like to offer your thoughts? Uh, in my view, uh, China has a more strong key to serve the North Korea issue, like uh, uh, Gorbachev uh, had the key to make the united German. Uh, North Korea overcame the crisis caused by the crepes Eastern Europe. So also I think the uh, Jasmine Revolution uh, f influence a uh, very little in North Korea, so uh, it's uh, it's a very uh, critical time and a very important time uh, when U.S. Uh, food aid start. I think. Thank you very much. And Ambassador Pritchard, patient. Uh, let me be. Um uh, as uh, concise as I can with regard to food aid. There's a political reality that no country is going to publicly oppose what is perceived as a, um, an actual food emergency. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there is not behind the scenes tensions caused, um, and, and I would suggest primarily the manner in which the United States has dealt with North Korea in the distant past, and, and this is not a reflection on what you might suspect my views of the Bush administration, but my participation in the Clinton administration, where we all have had a, a, a consistent message to the North Koreans about how and when we provide a food aid to internationally recognized uh, emergencies. The reality of that uh, turned out to be a quid pro quo for political um, a compromise on the part of the North Koreans. So there, there is a history of that with the North Koreans that is well understood by the South Koreans. Uh, so I think it, it's a, uh, ultimately a question of how it is perceived, how transparent it is, but I go back to the first point because we cannot and will not, uh, from government's point of view, public, uh, publicly opposed humanitarian aid, um, I, I think it ultimately will have a minimal impact uh, on the relationship, which was the question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, please, General Hong, Representative Chang. Uh, from the information that I heard uh, when I was in Korea, uh, the uh, food situation in the north uh, was not that much bad. And uh, what they were uh, saying was that there were about you know, 4.3 million uh, ton of you know, harvest uh, by uh, North Korea itself uh, during the past year. And uh, every year they had about 100 tons of, uh, 100 uh, million, huh? yeah, 100 million ton of you know, shortage uh, in North Korean uh, food situation, and so it was not uh, worse than you know previous years. Uh, and uh, we heard, you know, uh, another information was that uh, they were uh, there were uh, kind of you know, the uh, movement uh, in the north. 
uh, to collect uh, military provision uh, from the civilian uh, community. And so uh, worsening the situation of uh, food uh, in the North Korean uh, civilian society uh, is caused by that kind of movement to collecting uh, this kind of military uh, visions. Uh, and we understand that kind of uh, storing uh, military pre provision, provision is uh, to prepare for uh, uh, next year's, you know, celebrating 100th birthday of uh, uh, the Kim Il Sung, and uh, to uh, celebrate their uh, kind of um, strong, uh, prosper uh, prosperous, uh, great country of North Korea. As they are to celebrate that kind of you know, the uh, meaningful year, they are collecting uh, that kind of they are storing uh, that kind of you know, rice. Huh? Uh, more and more gain. And what I understood from the, uh, the newspaper daily uh, in Seoul uh, yesterday, that uh, they were briefing uh, in Rome from the WFP uh, related to uh, food situation of North Korea. And there were uh, not clear kind of you know, evidences of a shortage of the, uh, food in North Korea. Uh, the responses from the uh, participants the participants were from uh, most of European countries, together with the United States, Japan, and Korea. Uh, their responses were uh, relatively very cool because the, the evidence and uh, their rationale uh, to explain the situation of uh, North Korean uh, food condition uh, was not clear. And uh, of course, you know, uh, as my colleague member, Pak Sung Woon, uh, mentioned, we don't have any opposition to uh, aid North Korea uh, to liberate uh, from uh, their food shortage. Uh, but what we uh, pay attention is why don't we develop more uh, kind of clear, uh, kind of means, transparent means that could be directly eh, uh, delivered to uh, starving peoples. Uh, and so, uh, if uh, we uh, have a kind of clear as kind of responses from the north and the genuine as kind of request of those kind of rights, then uh, we will uh, uh, very sincerely consider uh, what kind of measures to be taken and also close consultation would be made with the United States and Korea. And so uh, I concur with you know, uh, the Jack's uh, comments that uh, they wouldn't be uh, just limited, uh, just a little uh, kind of you know, the, uh, uh, impact or uh, kind of, <coughs> of very few kind of impacts uh, in terms of you know, our alliance. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Chung, will give you the last word. <laughs> Please call me MJ. <laughs> okay. Right. MJ, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, <laughs> And recently, I discovered another MJ. new famous MJ from Harvard University, Michael Joseph Sandal. <laughs> well, it's time to close this meeting. Thank you very much for your coming. Before this meeting, I promised my colleague, Dr. Kim, to take him to George Washington Parkway to show him the scenic view of the Potomac River, my favorite place in Washington, D.C. So thank you very much. And before closing, two comments. As for food aid to North Korea, as you may have observed, you, this is a bipartisan delegate, but we are divided between opposition and government party. But I want to tell you there is a division not only between opposition and government party, but more fundamental division between executive branch of Korean government and legislature as a whole. Executive branch is more prudent, more prudent. While we all together, we all of us as elected officers, compared with the prudence of executive branch, we are more, we are more close to giving out aid to North Korea. This can be described institutional inertia, as Pritchard said, but this is also professional and <laughs> political inertia. 
we, are, we have to prepare for our next election, all of us here. While president, he, his term is only five years single term. He does not have to worry about next election. So there is a difference between the executive and legislative branch. And my last comment is, I understand that the world never remains the same. If we think of the sheer magnitude of the geopolitics of the vast Eurasia continent, Russia, China, and North Korea, it should be considered a miracle, a miracle in progress that a small country called South Korea remains in the hands of a free, pluralistic democracy. And we are here in Washington to ask you to continue to pay proper attention on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. With this, we are adjourned. Thank you.